um, I think we are getting a few minutes over now, so um, I think we can get started. So um, in the last call, um, I did not make it. I'm not sure if um, anyone had a chance to discuss things and um, put them. Oh, I see, canceled here, okay, cool. So um, for this call, I wanted to take a look at uh, one PR. Um, 10302. Uh, so this PR adds uh, this PR adds some fields. So the major field it adds is um, guest stats. This is to the BMI status. Um, you can see here. And on these on, on the struct here, there are three more nuanced fields. Um, sample count, average, and variance. So right off the bat, the first thing that comes to mind is even though this is a pointer with uh, omit empty, these three fields do not have a pointer in front of them. So if I go check back at the um, API changes um, document that um, we had discussed in this call. So this document, just to recap, describes how we can add fields to a stable API for uh, alpha or uh, newly introduced um, alpha features. So this feature is going to be an alpha feature and the main struct here, it introduces the pointer, but based on uh, this document, uh, this, the underlying uh, structs they do not have uh, a pointers. So now, what would what would go wrong with these kinds of uh, with it not being pointer? Right, you can see this is clearly omit empty, but there is a pointer missing. So I started playing with uh, with the structs themselves, and here is what here is an example of what could go wrong. So in the first page, I so in the first response, I have page and it has omit empty and it has no uh, pointer here. And then it has a list of fruits. And in the second type, I have page with, uh, with omit empty as well as int star. And it has a type of fruits again. So it's the same API, one with the pointer, other without pointer. So when I run this uh, Marshall and non-Marshall, you could see that the, the specific page int field is missing here. And because it is missing, it, this is defaulting to zero. And because in the second one, it's not uh, missing, this is defaulting to a nil. So the reason why this is important for int is that zero is a valid integer. So for example, if any of these sample count, average or variance fields, if they are, indeed zero, then you will not be able to identify whether that zero is coming from an omit empty, which is the field missing, or it is coming from uh, a legitimate uh, zero record in, uh, in the observation. Fortunately, this API um, will not face that problem because all the three uh, fields are, uh, are updated at the same time. So if one is zero and the other two is not, then you can find that, okay, this is a valid entry while, because you have already made that assumption that all three will be updated once. Uh, although the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is, this is one of the intent of um, this working group is to, um, you know, boil down some best practices in a document. So this is one PR where it is not directly affecting if this does not adhere to the practices mentioned in the, the document, but if this is taken as an inspiration for other future APIs, then we could get into trouble, um, which I just described. So I, I want to pause here, um, it, see if folks have thoughts on this. So, um, 
the first from my from the first look usually uh, I must admit that for uh, stats specifically I really don't think we should ever have omit empty because uh, either we expect it or not but in this I think in this case it looks like maybe the if if the one of the parameters is, is uh, reported we would expect and demand that everything is reported so i think that it's wrong that it is only empty in the in the details and um, prob what can be omit empty is the the guest stats itself like if some uh, early version do not have it it will not be reported or or if some feature gate uh, protects from uh, reporting it, then the whole thing will not be reported. But it doesn't make sense that you will have sample count, but not have average or not have variance. It makes sense that everyone is together. Correct. Yes. That that is uh, that is the implementation of <laughs> this PM. <laughs> uh, the only issue. So while semantically it makes sense that only one, so all of these should be reported and they should not be omit empty. Um, why, what are the cases where we would need omit empty is, for example, let's say um, this is an alpha feature, right? And in, in beta or in GA, if you want to change the fields um, from say, variance to new variance because of some reason. Uh, if you want to change the name of the fields, then if you don't start out with omit empty, then the upgrade path from the current version uh, to the new version with the new field will break. Right? Yeah, but you could, you could, uh, so I think we need to be careful here because you are talking about what will happen if we need to deprecate something or change something or stuff like that. But I think let's start with the basic. The basic is that I want to understand if this is supposed to be reported as a whole or not. Is it valid to report only half of the parameters here uh, of an implementation or not? So that's the my my first uh, my my first stage of checking this. The second stage, what you just said, I think that's solvable by just if if someone will change, uh, we want to change uh, the name, as you said. Uh, so that's then, that's correct, that's uh, Edward. I I agree with you. The very first check is to see if this is to be reported as a whole or not, and I think I agree with you there that. The way this PR is implemented, it is reported as a whole. So it will there will never be a case where one entry is reported and the other two is not. So uh, I think we are in agreement there. But what I'm saying is that since this is an alpha feature, and what we are saying is that alpha for alpha features, we don't uh, guarantee that the API will be as it is, that's the whole point of alpha feature, right? If if we guarantee about the API, uh, about alpha features, then we'll have to do a lot more work. Like they will have to evolve in beta and GA release. So the fact that this is an alpha release means that these fields are supposed to change in the future. If they, in worst case, in best case, if they don't and the feature uh, really goes well, it's well implemented, then we will continue with the same fields. But we do have to prepare for that uh, case where where the fields need to evolve a little, little bit, right? Yeah, I'd only tweak that. I, I wouldn't say that it's supposed to change, but definitely, uh, you know, can't guarantee it won't, which is what you said, so. Yeah. So, so you are saying that, so let me understand correctly. So let, you are saying now that it's not related to the omit empty. So you're, you're, or you want it to be always omit empty, even though everything is together. That's right. And this is, yeah, what I'm saying is this should be omit empty and we should have an int star here because then we identify three states, zero, which is a legal state, nil, which is an, which is coming due to omit empty 
and um, any other valid uh, integers. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So if it's not omit empty, what will happen? So if it is not omit empty, and let's say uh, we want to change the sample count uh, field to a sample count average or, or something different, then during an upgrade, what will happen is the, the new version will expect sample count new field. The old version will expect sample count, which is th this field. And you will have a different struct, which will not be able to serialize uh, during an upgrade. Because the, the JSON tags are missing. Uh So, so what you this is like uh, what you are saying is a bit uh, it it feels it feels like I'm always supposed to uh, which is it is it really this is what they are doing like uh, let's say in Kubernetes like every time I I need to create something I need to think about uh, setting it to meet empty just because so I cannot enforce the whole the me implementing it correctly using the what the api uh, is giving me i'm forced to work like in with with a little uh, bit like this because you understand if if, if i'm not setting the omit empty here i cannot i cannot uh, make uh, a mistake of not reporting all of them it's like it's a must. The the API is enforcing it on me. But if I if you if we let the omit empty there, then then I may forget to set one of them, and that's it. And, and nothing enforces forces me to to report these fields. That's right. Know? So I think the guidance is that this enforcement of how the API is supposed to look like uh, should come at uh, admission webhook level. So let me go to the reference document, right? This is the document which we've discussed where if you want to introduce a new field in an existing stable API version, uh, they say it should add omit empty tag, it should have optional. And then through examples, they have stayed here that uh, for, for, um, fields like integer floats, which could have a different state on empty, you should have an in star uh, okay, as in so, a pointer. Okay, so uh, so let me ask you, okay, I understand. So what what will happen if we, if let's say that, let's say we are in alpha when we are collect, collecting feedback and now we want to change one of the names, maybe remove it or, uh, those other things, right? What will happen mm -hmm. if we if if such a change in this uh, in this case, we could just change the guest stats, right? Like the the whole thing. Like we cannot change individual. If it's not a omit empty, then we are forced to change it uh, the whole struct together. Like we'll have guest stats too. That's the, so the alternative, right? If we you have you'll have guest stats too yes but any of the field here would lead to uh having the new struct so that's one point and the second point is that uh well let me think about it so if you have a new struct and if you report the old field will it be json serializable Yes, I think you just need a different name. Like the guest stats in this case must be reserved because we change it to guest stats too. So it will be guest stats too. Uh, and then if if someone uses the old one, then the then the old one will, I guess, will have no effect. And in case uh, in case uh, you will use the new one on an old API, then it will be ignored because it will put a nil. 
because uh, it's omit empty, it will be a nil for the guest stats, but it will be uh, some value uh, in guest stats too, but that value is ignored because the old API doesn't recognize it. Something like yes. that. Yes, and you have to figure out a way to convert old to new, right? So... Yeah, I don't think you need to convert old to new in, in alpha. It's like, I think alpha is uh, intentionally uh like no no but I, these I think... old old struct will be present in the storage so for any vmis which are created uh before the upgrade with this particular version will have dirty rate stat struct stored in hcd right uh in yes. in, in the storage so then we will have to find a way to convert that dirty stat rate stats older field into newer field uh the two v2 so i don't think for i think in this case for stats for example what will really happen is that uh, um, i think the stats is overridden so like it you will do an upgrade right and then the controller will uh, reconcile and update the stats and uh, and it will just override the it will just put only the new thing. It's it is it it's an update usually. It's not a patch, so it will replace the whole manifest with uh, with a new one that will include the new statistics, not the old one. So the old one will get just be flushed out. This is, I think, what usually happens. I am. Mm. It's like it's because it's under the stats, not not because it's if it was under the spec, then probably you're right. In the spec, this may be a problem. But I'm uh, so but... so yeah. That that makes sense that it will it will just be overridden, but the field will continue to exist in uh in API server. Well, in in HCD, right? Because we have stored it. And then we don't have conversion logic. So when you make an update, the, oh, you're saying, because oh. this is an update, the old field will be defaulted to nil and the new yes. field will will come up in HCD itself. Yeah, so for, okay. I think for, for, okay, let me, maybe this is a good, uh, a good example of uh, when we need to care more or less. Like, I think this is like, it requires some uh, validation also from your side. I think that for under, if you have the, the in the manifest, the spec and the status, right? Mm -hmm. Then whatever is in the status is is always reconciled. So it's always getting updated all the time. And that one is less problematic because once you have an upgrade, the new, they will use the new, I mean, the controller will use the new API. And the new API will use an update or they will override anything that was there before and an update with the new with a few new fields and the old fields will be, as you said, new. But for the so, spec... Hold on, let me stop you there. So yeah. that's that's not entirely true. And why I'm... What is the missing piece here? Is that so when you roll a kubevert upgrade, right? Yeah. The the order of components in which upgrade is rolled out is uh, is such that API server, kubevert API server is the last. So you will have the, uh, the APIs upgraded last while the controller and the word handlers will be upgraded before them. So the the, which kubevert API we are talking about? The kubevert API server. But the Kubert API, Kubert API server is not uh, it is not affecting here, has no real effect here. I think like uh, the Kubert, Kubert API server, as far as I know, uh, it has like two. Maybe you are you are explaining what you meant because it has two two things that it needs to take care of. One is uh, is usually accepts commands from the like. Uh, uh, from the virt CTL or from mm -hmm. someone that is sending a command using the some uh, endpoint and the second second thing that he does it's I think it's under its uh, head 
is uh, that it has the web hooks there. So, Correct. Yeah, that's so that's exactly what I'm saying. So what yeah. will happen is the API server which validates the web hook, they will have the older structs, and the controller because it rolled out first, it will have the new struct. So because it is trying to create the object, the newer object, V2 object, which does not have the old fields and has the new fields, it will not be accepted by, well. What do you mean not accepted? But because well, the web, I, yeah. webhook does not have the new fields, right? The V2, but, so it will default to zero. Well, Neil. But why will the webhook try to do? I mean, I'm trying to understand in which case the webhook will will care about this uh, stats in general, in the status that in general. Uh, in the case, well, even if it cares or does not care, it has to do that. Oh, the serialization, right? The JSON serialization. Yes. Yeah, so it will if it's a. Uh... It will do a serialization, so either it will see something that that it understands it that doesn't help anyone, or it doesn't see something, right? Something like that. I, I mean, yeah, which, what, is, what is the scenario that will get into trouble? So with the scenario we will get into trouble is that it will not, so because it has to serialize, it will not see the V2 field. So even if the controller is updating uh, v2 uh, temporarily it will send it, it it will see as nil and it will uh, continue to create this as nil and only when API server is indeed upgraded then all the controller uh, observations will be uh, correctly reported so the way i think in this in this i think the web books in general i don't think they will uh... So you maybe the mutation webhook will have something to do with it, but I don't think the regular webhook will care about anything in the status. This is why I think this is how it goes. Like, okay, um, let me take. But uh, maybe, maybe so... we, we should not get into. Maybe the we will. I'm hijacking this discussion. So how about creating a, after this meeting, just creating a scenario about uh, what can go wrong in uh, at least with status and and uh, and we can discuss it further like through emails or, or uh, so through... let me like... let me ask you this i'm i'm willing to create a, a scenario with what could go wrong but do we really have to consider status and spec fields separately the reason why i ask is api is a contract right and we are establishing best practices for API. So regardless of whether those fields are introduced in spec or status, we should have similar best practices for both. And the yeah. implementation issue like this, where, okay, we are lucky that this particular scenario that bad, bad case or bad scenario does not apply. Uh, yeah, we are lucky and we will just still consider the best practice for uh, consistency. Okay, yeah, that's a good reasoning. I'm, I'm not against it. I'm just trying to, the pro, I think the, the main thing that I'm, uh, it may end up, as you said, that we'll, you will use the more strict full rules possible. But my concern is that if it will be so strict full for adding anything, including uh, status fields, which sometimes we add a lot, then it feels like we are uh, we are limiting ourselves a lot, uh, like a lot. Like it will not be something uh, small. It will cause us a lot of uh, um, painful painfulness. I would okay. say because because I think in in many. I mean, it depends on how it goes. Uh, usually, like. If we go into alpha and, and you have such a field, right, like this, and then what are the chances that it will change in the future that I need to rename something? That's the first question. If I just need to add more things, that's a different. So 
I'm saying what what how hard you you we make it for uh, contributors uh, to get uh, to get along with this and what are the risks so if if the risk is very low like in some scenario it will really cause a lot of pain and we don't want to have it so we'll have to be the most strict for everybody. but if that that chance is very very low uh, it feels like uh, we are uh, making harder for contributors to work but if that's the if that's what it what it what ha has to happen it will happen right i'm not uh, I'm yeah not, yeah yeah no i think i am understanding the spirit of what uh, what you are getting at is that we would be okay making that strictness but we should know exactly what is the trade off of making that decision yeah. and that's where the data points of what exactly will fail if we uh, what exactly will fail if we have dirty sets v2 as a separate struct or if we have sample count uh, as a separate field we should work out those scenarios probably discuss it in the next call and and you know come up to a conclusion Yes, maybe uh, this is also a good, a good, uh, maybe a subject to have here because we talked about webhooks, which are causing a lot of pain here. Like the scenario that you said that uh, the vertep, the webhooks are, I prefer to call it like the webhooks are upgraded last, right? Like you said, this is causing. Uh, I think this is like, if I just think about that, uh, that thing, then we have probably a lot of problem today because, um, we are. We are we are doing a lot, some mutations in the code at the webhook, mm -hmm. and we are also doing validations in the in the webhook. Like sometimes the validation are too much. Like for example, in the in the webhook, we are doing we are even contacting other components at that time. Like the webhook will go to some some the Kubernetes config, for example. Yep. Like it go to that CR and fetch from it information. So what Correct. are you, you what uh, this is really bad. So in this case, so we have a, we have, I think one of the, there were some people in the, uh, in the group that not in, in, in this group now, but uh, that were saying that we should limit the webhook uh, usage to a bare minimal and not to go and fetch status from other places of the cluster and so on. So I think what you said opens up that question as well, like unrelated to what you just said, but no, when... that's, that's it. so. Um, what you are saying is one hundred percent correct. And in our downstream deployments, we had upgrade issues where the controller and the word handler were working on old, old fields. The webhook was expecting new fields and they were defaulting it uh, differently and the upgrade broke. So that's where th that bug exactly is where these the scenario that I described is coming from. It's not a made up uh, case. We have hit those kinds of issues and that's a very, very valid discussion. Although what I'm curious about is that what would be the end goal of that discussion? So what I am thinking is that if we make the API contract and the API best practices strict enough, then it should handle uh, it, it should handle the webhook version skew. So what I'm what I mean by that is that the controllers and the handler, they are working on a version skew, which is one down, well, one above the webhook. So it's just a version skew of plus or minus one. And by default, we should have APIs that work with plus or minus one uh, version skew. Okay. so. Maybe for the next time, I will just say one thing here, just to, I think we need to uh, just consider it. I don't know. Consider that if you are in alpha, let's say that we can do it in beta, but if you are in alpha, inside alpha, I consider not taking care of this stuff at all. Like if things are changing inside the alpha, 
uh, make it uh, suggest what needs to be done or uh, or raise this all all these problems but but I think inside alpha uh, you should be less strict like if you are going to beta then make it very strict that you cannot do all kind of things but I think inside of alpha you you should have more freedom because uh, I will not want to take care of upgrades inside alpha because inside alpha, I, I, from my point of view, you are not supposed to even trust this uh, feature. If you are in production, you should not pro sure, for sure should not use it. Uh, just make, I mean, I want to to express that I want it alpha I to see. be very, very friendly to the developers. And in, if you are in the, if the developers are moving to beta, then we can be, more strict, but if I'm inside alpha, I want to be re really, really friendly and allow them to to do whatever they want, just to make sure they they get the feedback from whoever played with it and apply it without uh, making their life a hell. <laughs> I will say that's something like yes. that. Yes, makes sense. So, so I think the bottom line that you are suggesting is that. For alpha introduced fields, the the target should be if if the develop uh, if the production users do not use that alpha flag, they they will not uh, be worried about the upgrade. So because it is behind an alpha flag as long as that feature uh does not impact all all the uh, apis sorry all the uh, vmis with or without the uh the status field we should not be worried about that because a production use case will definitely not uh turn on that feature and if they do then it like we don't care about the upgrade yes the, at least this is an option that we can raise that if this is acceptable i think this should be makes sense i mean it, to me it makes sense that it gives a little bit of freedom to play with it without uh, having restriction but once you get into marking it as beta then you are playing in the in the rules of almost the production and you cannot break and something like that it's like you need to so be this uh this is okay i will consider that scenario i i think i have thoughts around it but we can we can park it for the next call yeah but what you just said i must admit that uh, with the webbook part i'm uh, if i think about it now it's like opening like a, a million other options which i it sounds troubling to me at least yeah. Um, let me take down some notes. Sorry, you were saying something. No, no, I'm just saying that I, I, I remember that we, whenever we worked on adding stuff and and considering the the upgrade path or what will happen to existing uh, VMIs and so on, I I don't think I we we. We give enough enough uh, weight, I will say, uh, uh, or focus on this uh, webbook thing because I'm I'm seeing it. We are trying to I'm tr at least I'm trying to avoid it as much as possible. But a lot of people are are using it uh, to do a lot of things. Like in, and they are not using the controller because one option is to use the controller. To do to have all kind of rules and detect that there is a problem and then uh, and then report the problem and so on. But the other option, which a lot of developers are using, is that they add it to the webbook and the webbook checks something and if it's not correct, it will fail or it will do something like that. So I think this mm -hmm. the point that the webbook is upgraded last. I'm not really sure that they even consider it when they do. Right. It. Yeah, uh, so the the problem, and that's the problem I'm trying to address here, right? So my thought process is that 
if all API changes are carefully vetted. So, so I'm proposing a list of things, right? And the upgrade workflow is one of those checkpoints. So if all the APIs and uh, alpha feature changes are going through this vetting, then we should be able to uh, account for slips in, in that. So, uh, I mean, what, what you're saying is, I agree with that 100%. And uh, as a part of this call, we should definitely, you know, make sure that new feature implementers uh, understand that this is the workflow and this is where it could go wrong. Yeah. Okay, and um, oh, one more thought I had is that, so if I look back at how Kubernetes does this, right? So the problem we have right now is that the, the webhook, it talks to kubevert CR for some of the defaults and then does uh, validation or mutating defaults uh, from that. While that is a good flexibility, it opens up a can of worms. I would be curious to see what will happen if instead of taking the defaults from the CR, kubevert CR, if we could find a way to uh, give default and configuration uh, to as command line flag or as uh, a YAML to to the API server itself, instead of taking it from the CR. What that would do is it would definitely change the expectation where if you want to have a change in the defaults, you'll have to restart the API server. And that uh, brings more flexibility to API implementation. I have not thought this workflow through, but at least initial thoughts are having, reducing that expectation where you change the defaults on a, a restart of the system is much more friendly to API uh, implementation than handling the edge cases of defaults changing on the fly. Yeah, but I think that the pro the thing is that in in such a distributed system uh, that everything is reconciled all the time, it's like usually you it ex the expectation is that you change you can if you want to change the default you change the default and the system uh, adjusted itself to make it to make it work like. Um, it needs it it there is needs to be someone like uh, for example a controller that makes sure that everything is in sync and uh, but yes the problem what you are saying the is but I'm not sure that if you reset the virt API for example is is good it's enough like I'm not really sure maybe maybe the solution is that you need uh, the there is a need to create another CRD that has defaults or a config map or whatever and then uh, that is reconciled all the time or, or you can, someone is responsible of making changes there in a way that is almost atomic or something like that. Mm. But, yeah. but I, I'm not sure if you can really go and change the virt API itself. How, how could you change it? So, um... Well, um, I'm not talking about changing the, the virt API. I'm talking about where it reads those defaults from, right? Uh, right now it reads from uh, a CR and that CR does not really track. So what happens is in in some cases, we have reviewed uh, API changes where the, a new API field was introduced, which was an omit empty field. That field had default coming from cube CR. So if you have VMIs with one default right now in kubectl, then for until you change that kubectl field, default field, you will have one set of VMIs with that default field. And then upon upgrade, or sorry, upon changing the CR default, 
you will have the next set of VMIs with the new default. And at that time, you don't know what to do with the old ones because the code assumes that it will have all the CRs with one default, which is in the cubes here. No, the, that's uh, not exactly correct. It, the default, I mean, think that the, the current implementation, and I guess it's also the expectation, is that if you put some some default there, then anything new that is created will take that default that is there. It will not change if you, I mean, if you change that, uh, like let's say you have a VM and it got a default from there. If you if you change the default and you created a new VM, the new VM gets a different default, right? A different value, and uh, and they they are working independently. But maybe the, you are. Maybe the the question is: Is the default part of the the new CI, like the VMI, for example, is it part of the VMI spec now, or is mm -hmm. it somewhere inside the code? That's what maybe maybe that's what you meant. No, 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 no. You you're right. The expectation is that, but then. With that expectation, we need to keep into account in the code that the defaults change over time, right? Yes. The code was not accounting for that. It was assuming that all the VMIs currently in the system will have only one and one default, which is from the cubeboard CR. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that those are the kinds of pitfalls that uh that should be as a best practice in in this particular call. That it, that's another uh, pitfall um, which I have seen a lot um, made in in the assumptions. Yes, I think there is now. A, if you want, there is now. A, I remember last week there was a PR about something like that, and I actually because I have really bad experience with defaults, it caused a lot a lot of problems. In, uh, I'm working in networking many, and it caused a lot of problems there. These defaults mm -hmm. and a lot of bugs. So I commented that, but there is the, exactly the same thing. It's like uh, they take a default from the they create define a default in the covert uh, CR, and then then it is applied. I think it is applied on the VMI spec, if I'm not mistaken. Like, yeah. yeah so as part of the next call, would you be able to walk through that that PR? Uh, what I want to take away is take that PR and just like how we've discussed these two uh, as potential best practice option for for the SIG, um, we could have that that PR as as a third one. And you know, come up with some kind of general thing that can be put it that can be put in the docs. Yeah, this is the this is I can I put it I'll put it here. I think this was it. I after I think this was the the one that was discussed. Um, okay. But yeah. Okay. Uh, let me take that down. But but maybe I mean I'm not sure if they will continue with this spell, but that's a good example of using defaults. It uses defaults with a mutation to my book. And there are a lot of like there are we have a lot of those. Okay. All right. I have I'll walk through that PR and see if I can find cases. Um although for this particular PR, uh, I do have one more use case. Or one more case where this might break. So the the main business logic of this PR is implemented in this get guest stats updater. What it does is here it calls the launcher client and it gets the stats from from the launcher. Uh, client. So this is a gRPC API. Yeah. So as I mentioned in the upgrade workflow, uh, the the controller and the word handler are deployed first, and then the API uh, is deployed second. Well, in this particular case, there is one more, which is the word launcher. Now, when the upgrade will be rolled out 
the existing VMIs will have word launcher, which is one version behind. So it will not have the guest uh, stat gRPC method implemented. So what will end up happening is that my understanding is that if a method is not implemented, you will get an unimplemented gRPC error. So that will be bubbled up uh, here in the execute and you will always get failed uh, update get stat error message uh, for old uh, for old VMIs yes. after the upgrade. And this will totally blow up the uh, word handler logs because this this is um, continuously reconciling. So with a back off, it will continuously, uh, you know, be on a loop. And let's say if you have ten VMIs on on a word handler, which is a reasonable assumption, the logs will be full of these uh, failure messages. Yes, actually, I don't even like the you know, what you're showing me here is is I don't know I don't know if we have others like this I I don't think so because usually we report back guest guest agent information using the periodic uh, reporting from the virt launcher to the virt handler and not by a command and that looks really I don't I don't think that makes sense. It's like it breaks. I don't. I don't understand if it. Ex you are saying the command is new, right? Yeah. So this yeah. So, word launcher client. Yeah, this is new. It does not yeah. exist currently in the. the yeah. So what part. we what yeah, what happens today? Uh, the guest all the guest agents information is reported uh, together with uh, with other domain information through the. Uh, it's like a notifier from the virt launcher to the virt handler. It's like uh, it goes. Uh, I don't know if, if you are familiar with that code. There is like a code that says every event that virt uh, triggers or uh, if a periodic has passed, like of either, mm -hmm. then there the the domain there is a domain structure. That domain structure is built, including the guest yep. the guest uh, information. And that is uh, pushed towards the virt launcher, also through gRPC, but it's pushed like through its, uh, it's like a fake, uh, uh, what I call, I forgot the name. Yeah, fake uh, cache informer. and fake events, right? Yeah, fake yeah, informer. No, it's like yeah. an informer, it's an informer, like a, like a fake informer on the virt handler side. So that, mm -hmm. uh, and then it is processed there in, in the reconcile loop. And that's the I way I believe we... it's the same extension. I believe this yeah. is the same extension, although, so yeah, let me take a look. No, if this is, because if you have a, if you have a command then it's not the same, because that was, that is not a command. That's like a, that's not through a command. That is like the messages from the virt launcher to the virt are triggered by events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, the, the, you're talking about the trigger but what happens once it is triggered, the reconcile loop gets started, right? And it talks to the launcher client through other commands to get that information. No, I don't think so. I don't, I'm not familiar with... Uh, uh, I, I think is... that's what happens. So the domain cache will trigger an event into the launcher reconciler. And then, uh, well, even in the uh, word handler reconciler, and then from there, the reconciler will talk to the launcher client and get the the newest information and update the status. I think this is the same uh, implementation. Although what is happening here is that a new gRPC method is being added, but a scenario where older VMIs do not have that particular uh new grpc method is not handled uh and and the reason why i'm calling it out here is this could be a very common uh upgrade problem as well in terms of uh api so this is not exactly api field a user ap user facing api field 
but this is a internal impl implementation API change uh, that is causing problem. Yeah, it's it's internal. I, I I'm sending you the link here. What I meant, I don't know if it's the same. I'm not sure I'm, we are talking about the same thing, but this is the link of uh, where we send. Uh, this is the whole this uh, switch part. It's uh, you get events and then it it compose it, it composes the domain structure and then it, it sends the it sends it to the virt handler and all the information mm -hmm. is there. This is what I meant. I mean, usually the virt handler is not sending commands to get information from the virt launcher. Like it, there are cases that it does it, but it's very rare. Usually it doesn't happen and usually it doesn't make sense that it will go this way. So usually this feedback loop is uh, is is sending the it's sending at least the, let let's I can tell I can talk about networking right so the guest agent is collecting network information so the network information are sent from here we are not collecting it from the virt handler like you don't have code in the virt handler that says get guest agent information uh, in order to update the network parameters no the the network parameters are coming through the domain uh, structure. I see. But again, so where is this event being received? Uh, it's received in in the uh, uh, this is the when you when you look at the send uh, send domain event this one right. We are talking about the the link that I sent the send domain event. Mm -hmm. In the end, you'll see it, it creates uh, uh, it creates. Oh, wait a second. It it say uh, it does a uh, does a v one client handle domain event and then it sends the it's this is what it sends it in the end and it is received at the virt lander in the recall side. I'll show you. I mean the. The reconcile loop of the virt handler. Okay. I'll... Uh, so, but if there if there is something, uh, at least this is what I I know that happens. But you know, maybe it ha other odd things are happening. So. <laughs> so um, here, right? Domain information add event. So I think you get this event. Yes. Update Your update event, right? Update yes. Okay, but in any case, if you look at if you look at the virt handler, then the, in any case, the, the in the request here that that what is sent is it's actually they are sending the the domain. It includes the domain JSON, status JSON, event type. But what matters here is the domain JSON, or I think, if I'm not mistaken, the domain JSON is marshalling the domain structure. Which is the which which on the virt handler side is uh, unmarshaled to and all this all its data includes includes the information that we are seeking. It usually it's, right. It's, so it's here, like thing. this is what is happening, right? So update function is getting that event, and it is only queuing up the key, right? So. Yes. The key, so the domain will have name and namespace, and it will queue up the key, and it yes. does not do anything with the domain itself. The domain yes. is in the cache, and then the reconcile or the sync or execute loop will, yes, will take a look at that. Okay, yeah, I I understand. It's that like part. it's like it pushes it. It's like it pushes the information like that. This is what I know. Uh, it is rare that we are. It is pretty rare that we are using commands and, and that command usually is bad. Like if you if we used commands against the virt launcher, it uh, it must be done through the virt handler and it's costly. It's like you always try to to access it uh, in many, many areas. So usually it's it's better to use the existing uh, uh, I don't know, it's up, uh, sync and feedback loop that exists today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there are commands like uh, I I know that uh, for example there are commands that are coming for virt API. So if virt API wants to see the whole domain information, it will go to the virt handler. 
and the virt handler will send a command to the virt launcher and get the information and report it and give it back to the virt API. So there are uh, exceptions here, but uh, I don't know if this new thing that they created is included in this. Uh, I don't think it's supposed to be included in this exception, but the, I guess. Uh, okay, I, I'll, yeah. I'll ask that question. Okay, and just saying that maybe the, the way it was done is not as part of the other thing. So maybe that's also a problem, but yes. Yeah, we got uh, into a lot of details here. No, I think that's the whole point of this uh, call. I I believe this is what we, we have to vet and it will, so I think initially all of these best practices will take some time to to get collected, but over time, um, the process will, will be smoother. That's my hope. So, um, thank thanks for, thank for walking me through all the details and um, you know talking about this workflow. So for the next call, I will take a look at this mutating PR. We'll see if there is some uh, general uh, best practice we can boil down from there. And we'll think about the scenarios with alpha features and the APIs as well as the webhooks. Okay. Yeah, it's, it, it's a lot. Point, yeah. yeah, it's a lot. Do you, uh, can you put on the top of the document all the links of, uh, because we are going through the Kubernetes documentation. Can we have it, I don't know, can we have it like in the top so everyone will see it? Uh, they can reference everything there. Uh, it will just help. Yeah, Go definitely. Well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Edward. Appreciate your time. Bye bye.